Welcome to the Russell Hobbs Show today. We have a special guest in the studio with us. The illustrious Frank Campagna joins us. How you doing, Frank? Yeah, doing good. How are you today, Russell? Pretty good, man. Good to have you. Let's uh, rock and roll, have some fun, and roll down memory lane, future lane, whatever lane oh, jumps boy. up. boy. Here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, you know, it's funny. I've known you for like, a long time, decades, mm-hmm. and yet, you know how life is, you know a lot of people, and you're involved on and off, and then I don't really know that much, uh, maybe a lot of people don't know much about how you grew up, what, where you went to school, and all that kind of thing, so start off with the early years. Uh, I was born in New York City, 1956, July 4th, 1956 to be exact, uh, in the middle of Manhattan. A uh, family wanted to get out of New York City and moved down to South Jersey, there was a small suburb called Levittown. This is 1958 it was built. There were sub, it was a division that Joseph Levitt put together, and he put together three. It was for a post-World War II vets or whatever. So there was Levittown, New Jersey, Levittown, Pennsylvania, and Levittown, New York. Mail kept getting mixed up, so they eventually changed the name to um, Willingboro. But it's South Jersey, not too far from Philly. You know, it's very beautiful in South Jersey. It is. It's like a national forest down there. I never knew it till I went once in the 90s. Yeah, it's greatness. Actually, a lot of New Jersey is great. It gets dogged a lot, but so what? You know, Jersey's cool. They're tough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I grew up there to about uh, age 16 or so. My dad got transferred to Chicagoland, spent a couple of years there, graduated from high school there, then Right almost immediately afterwards, my family moved down here because my dad got transferred again. And uh, I was two weeks out of high school. I spent about two weeks here, and I said, no, I'm going home. And they're like, what do you mean home? I said, no, I'm going back to Chicago. So I spent about a year there then moved down here again and then went to college at East Texas State. That was a really screwed up year. That was a really messed up year, 1975, I guess. But... Four months of the year in Chicago, four months of the year living in Dallas, then for the last final four months living in Commerce, Texas. Culture shock, seriously, you know? No doubt. So you're really a big city kid. I mean, you grew up in New York, Chicago, and then you came to Texas. Yeah, it was great. Everywhere I moved was a smaller city and uh, cheaper weed. You know, (laughs) went from $30 an ounce to $25 an ounce to $20 an ounce. (laughs) Well, that's, amazing. That's, some of this had paraquat on it down <laughs> here, though. Some of that cheap weed. Yeah, that came around. So yeah, you, around. you're in Dallas. You went to school in East Texas. Was that art school in commerce? Yeah. Okay. And I just knew I wanted to be an artist. Um, I had some friends in high school. And they had a band called Rain, like a King Rains. And uh, they were very prog rock, very Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, yes, influenced. And they competed in a battle of the bands. I was a junior in high school, maybe even a sophomore in high school, when they had won the battle of the bands in Philly. And that got them a contract with uh, Led Zeppelin's Swan Song Records. Wow, that's great. And uh, the first band they signed, of course, was themselves. And then they signed Bad Company. And they signed my buddy's Rain. And so they went up to New York City to Electric Ladyland, record their first album. First night of pre-production or your singer decides, uh, I'm hungover, I'm not going to show up. Canceled the contract. That was it. That was it. Rain was over. You know, that was the end of their contract. That was it for them. That's when I realized, you know, as a young man in high school, I'm not sure if I want to be a musician or an artist. That hey, if anybody's going to screw me, it's going to be me, so I'm going to be an artist. <laughs> it's easier. I'm not going to let some singer or something mess me up. Right. It's like the difference in <clears throat> being in an individual sport or a team sport. Mm-hmm. You thought you want to control your own destiny. Wow, what a terrible opportunity loss there. Yeah, well, not my life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So you were going to school in commerce, art school, and came back. Uh, so when did you go? I mean, I know I've seen, like, you know, we're all on Facebook now talking about memories and the old rock scene and everything. And I was always going to the Agora Ballroom, you know, in the late 70s. I'd see like the Talking Heads first tour ever, mm-hmm. you know, at Agora, and they're doing Take Me to the River and the Police first tour, the Roxanne. Yeah, tour. I worked at those places. And you worked at a lot of those places. What was your first gig like working in a club? Um, DJs. 
on Lower and, Greenville, 2000 Greenville Avenue. And uh, that was the first punk rock club in town. And it's like Nerve Breakers basically broke down the doors and started a lot of stuff in the city. Um, I mean, my first time to go to Deep Elm was to see Nerve Breakers at the Manhattan Clearinghouse, a building that's long gone now and it's like backs up to where the new 7-Eleven is. But uh, I remember going down there to see Nerve Breakers and looking out the second story window of Manhattan Clearinghouse and going, this reminds me of where I grew up. Light industrial neighborhood. It was very beautiful to me, you know, whereas my folks live up in North Dallas and I could never stand it because all the houses looked the same. Everything was generic to me, so... I kind of gravitated towards Steve Elm. But uh, Nerve Breakers were the first band to play at DJs as well. And, uh, I don't know, so I started going there like the second night, not the first night. First night was a private party, but Dolores realized, like, oh, there's money in this punk rock thing and started booking it on a regular basis. And uh, so I, you know, just wanted to figure out how to get into places to not have to pay money, to not have to spend money on beer, that kind of thing. And so early on, you were in the <clears throat> art and music. So what was your role like job at DJs? Oh, I'd do flyers. So mostly the you were already doing the art then for the promoting the clubs. Yeah. Okay. So I learned that stuff, and I ended up working with the Agora and the Palladium and the Winter Garden, Beaver Productions and Stone City and all of them, you know, and doing flyers for them. And, you know, for a young man, getting $35 for a flyer, and then another $35 to distribute it. And then doing that for two or three promoters at the same time, that was a good week, you know? Right. Plus, you felt like you were part of the scene. You were promoting bands you liked. Yeah. It's a it's a lifestyle rather than going to do a job you don't like. Yeah, I have to run into all the shops that, are, you know, that I liked and yeah. talk to all the, the people and give them free tickets and flyers and that type of stuff. And, hey, we got this coming up and this is going on and blah, blah, blah. And come on. You guys interested? I'll put you on the guest list. So I learned right, a lot awesome. back in the late 70s, early early 80s. Yes, yes, that's very cool. Did you ever go to the cellar? No, it was just before my time. It was, I know. It was, when I was a kid, we would go, because I grew up in Richardson, and we'd drive down to Deep Elm and go to Pearsall's to get the dispose, the dishwasher, dis, uh, the, the sink disposal. Yeah, you know, over that place. And you'd, get your, you'd trade it in or get it rebuilt or whatever, and we'd come down Main and take a ride on Central, and there was the cellar right there. And the I don't, cellar, I believe, was... Right next to Twilight Room. Yeah, the it's cell positive. exactly. You'd see it, it was on the other side of uh, of Central Express, right there, mm -hmm. right there on Main and Central. So I'd see the cellar. It was all had you know mural painted on it. And I, I, one time I saw a crowd in there. It must have been at night, but I was young. I was you know too young to go to a live music club. And it's funny because the cellar doesn't have a lot of you know Mother Blues. Everybody talks about and all these clubs that had a lot of you know people uh, stirring up the memories. But the cellar seems like the lost stepchild of memories. Maybe it wasn't Opalong or something. It was too early. That may be it. Yeah. Everybody's old and gone now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're at the cellar. Remember the 60s? Chances are you probably weren't there, right? Yeah. And it was like, <laughs> I mean, it was like serious, you know, mm -hmm. bikers and it was real 60s rock club. Well, you know, ZZ Top got their start out of there and Johnny Winter and Janis Joplin and lots of people touring. We'd play there first. Bugs Henderson. Uh, tons of people. I'm surprised you didn't go there, but you were just a little too young. I didn't move here. My family moved here in 74. I think it was already gone. Okay. You know, okay. I think that was late sixties. So. All right. I'm on, I'm on a quest yeah. about the cellar, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, okay. Let's, so the next phase of your life was, you know, DJs. And then, so did you ever work with Shannon, like <clears throat> at Tango or any of those clubs? I ended up booking some shows at Tango, but it was after Shannon left. You know, I um, would go to eight Oh from time to time. I don't know. I was more of a, a punk rocker than I was a new wave type person. Right, right. Um, I don't know. It, it's just more appealing, a little more pure, like as opposed to being diluted. Mm -hmm. Nothing against the cars, but <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, the the most rawest, in your face, brutally honest music has been punk, and then uh, I I credit Nirvana with a whole new moment of honesty in the early 90s you know everything was sort of glammy and fake again and then nirvana was kind of like that but yeah back what you're saying in the 70s punk was the brutally honest music yeah but uh, i mean i don't know how many times i saw the ramones they were really great you know <laughs> i used to really enjoy seeing them quite a bit but uh and rent ran into them and promoted them and 
that type of stuff quite a bit. You know, never had my name on the data line, never made a profit or loss, but I would do the flyers and I would definitely distribute it and get people excited about it. So, yeah, you seem like mostly you've been a guy that digs the art, you dig the music and you weren't really in it for money. Uh, but you, you end up knowing the bands and knowing the artists and having fun in the scene and contributing to the scene, but not necessarily doing it to exploit the bands and make money. The money part kind of steals the fun out of just about anything you want to do artistically, as far as I can tell. That's right. <laughs> it's really weird when, when, when your livelihood depends on it, then you have to do things you don't want to do, you know? Sometimes, anyway. It never made any sense to me until I started bugging bands myself and realizing, like, no, I'm not interested in Miami Sound Machine for $350 because, you know, I don't know what to do with Latin New Wave pop music and... Oops, I really can like turn down Gloria Esteban <laughs> for 350 bucks. Oh, no. Oops. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, some, it's funny because a lot of people don't know this. You know this, but <clears throat> you just mentioned something that, that kind of needs to be put out there. And that is when you have venues, because, you know, I've, I've been doing shows for 37 years and kind of in, a, in a, a bit of a break. We may reopen the Profit Bar in September in negotiations, but... What people don't understand is, and you know this, but when you're in with the agents in New York and LA and they email you, Hey man, we got this show, you know, we need holes and everything. The agents are sending you good and bad shows. Yeah. And the agent wants to send you all their shows and you get into this thing like, well, yeah, we made money on this one. We didn't lose our butt on that one. And we don't want this one. It doesn't but really you work. Take that it. Way. <laughs> you're taking all the stuff in the, in the pipeline or you get none of the stuff pretty much. So you're right. That's an example of how the commercial side can compromise your artistic mm -hmm. integrity or your, you know, your risk, your stress ratio, because the stress ratio raises when they start sending you a lot of bands. We, I've, I've bought so many tours that lost money the first two or three times, mm -hmm. and we'd lose money on them and develop that act in the house, you know, the theater gallery, the profit bar, the door, or whatever. And then the third gig, uh, Hard Rock Cafe, get it. After we developed piss the you off? Oh, we developed Big the time. act and get them up there to where they could be profitable and then somebody else gets them. Mm -hmm. And that's, and you know, you've experienced it too. And it's a, it's the kind of things that people don't really know about the uh, concert promotion industry is, is the your risk you go out on a limb to do to develop the acts that are coming around. Well, I got out June 29th, 1986. $1,200 guarantee to Sonic Youth with Lithium Christmas and Stickmen with Ray Guns, and I lost $400. <laughs> That's a, that was a great show. How could you lose on that one? Sunday night, maybe, maybe because it was too early for people to know Sonic Youth. 86, was that at Trees? or No, Trees was wasn't no Twilight Room. Twilight Room? Mm -hmm. That was a great show, though. Mm -hmm. But I was glad I was, I'd made up my mind. That's it. I'm out. I'm having a, got a kid on the way. This is what I'm doing. So, wow. Did. So, when did you get married in this timeline? Mm, sometime in May, May 23rd or something. So it was just prior to. Remember, um, so around 85, you got married. Then. No, 86. Okay, so 86. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, June uh, 29th was the last show. Frankie was born October 21st. Right. Right. So, but I had to, you know, do something different. I knew what I was doing, but I, I don't know about Theater Gallery. Theater Gallery was always nicer than Twilight Room, you know? It was more, not putting it down or anything, but a nicer, cleaner, more Dallas, North Dallas type crowd. Um, innocent kids, good kids, whereas Twilight Room was more of a hardcore criminal element. In a lot of cases. Well, I wouldn't say the word criminal, but I'll touch on that. You know, it's funny. I used to go to the Circle A Ranch mm -hmm. back, this girl from Denton. I was going to school in Denton, you know, forever. I, I'd go to I'd go to college for a semester and then go start, you know, go design and build stuff and make money and go to Mexico. And then I'd go back to college because college never was that fun. No. You know? <laughs> but it was inspiring. I was the kid that, like, I didn't want to study and do all the homework, but I'd talk to the professor after class in literature because it was so inspiring or something, right? Or my art teacher. But anyway, so uh, this Julie girl from Denton took me to the Circle A Ranch in like 81 or three. And uh, I think it was, yes. 
and it was it, you're right it was a very edgy punk and hardcore scene you know it was it was it was very cool it was like a whole nother world right within within the dallas world yeah and um and uh to, to differentiate between that and the theater gallery is is an important point because what we did at the theater gallery we we started a gallery of course a lot of north texas state artists and then we had some we had bands start playing with zeitgeist and other bands but it wasn't punk or hardcore it was not it was suburban kids with original bands coming and playing you know rock or what you would call new wave some of them had a, yeah. actually had a keyboard and hairspray right <laughs> oh, there are great bands great music it was it was it was, it was a it was a, a the all the full colors of the rainbow scene you know it's a gentle scene early on the theater gallery for a couple of years was was theater and art and, you know, the flaming lips and all these really cool bands. You brought a meat puppet show early on in 85 and, and uh, it was a really cool thing. And I think when the, the punk scene at twilight room started moving down the street and we booked some of those bands and I think it was a mistake. I think we should have just let Charlie keep all that element and do what we were doing. And it would have been a way more harmonious thing because you know, we didn't want to compete with anybody else. No. Right? I don't think so. And it was it just in in hindsight it was a, it was a really not a good decision because my policy was kind of like let's just let everybody come, every kind of band and every genre and everything. And that was kind of naive in a way. We should have said, "No, punk and hardcore stay at the Twilight Room and we'll just do all the other stuff." You know, except we didn't have country or rap. And I think it would have been Probably smarter, but anyway, you can't change the nope. past. Long gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, it was a cool thing down there too. And Charlie Gilder, that, that the Twilight Room guy, he was—he's one of the only ones left. What does he do now? I don't talk uh, to him. He got married and sold or got out of bar soap and moved out to East Texas with his wife. And I think they live on her family's land or something. But I guess he's a cowpoke or something. So he's a smart guy that has a life now. He's yeah. not slaving for the next oh show God, tomorrow. He was doing that for a poor guy. <laughs> Never seemed real happy or really enjoying it too terribly much. Just you, always doing it. You'll, you'll, you're a guy that can relate to this. I've, I say this sometimes when I'm talking to people like, you know, be having a venue is it's like you're on the road all the time. Like bands roll in and their tour bus and they're like, Oh man, we've been on the road like 60 days. And I'm like, dude, all you have to do is play and wash your hair at a hotel room. <laughs> We've been on the road for 30 years, okay? We got a show every night. We have to deal with landlords, fire marshals, you know, health inspectors, work. staff, the TABC, the cops, so you can have a stage to play on. I never looked at it that way, but you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, let's see. I got a good picture of your, growing, your big city kid. You know, got into the art scene, promoting music, and and you've, you've done a lot. You know, Frank, you've done a lot for the whole arts and entertainment scene, and and uh, you're kind of like the uh, salt of the earth guy. It's been Thanks. doing it a long time. Uh, you have a gallery now uh, that's present day. I mean, you're still doing it. You know, after all these years, it's a very cool thing. So tell us about your current project. Well. Uh Started Kettle in 2005, pretty much right after the skinhead incident and trees and all that went down in 2004, 2005, whatever, you know. And uh, Deep Elm came to a screeching halt again. <laughs> and uh, one of the landlords, actually pretty much all the property owners came to me at one point or another and asked, what do we do now? And most of them, I'd just say, you know, hey, dude, you're the one who wasn't doing background checks. You're the one who had people shooting porn in your warehouse. You had people cooking meth in, you know, your building and that type of stuff because you weren't paying attention to who you're leasing to. You know, don't ask me. And then Don Cass came to me and asked me, you know, the neighborhood's in the toilet again. What do we do? I said, easy, back to the roots. Because he's like a kind of like a father figure to me. He's still around and he's a good man, you know. And uh, he said, is there any of my buildings you'd like to work with? I'll give you to you at my cost. I said, hmm, okay, let me talk to a couple of artists, see if we can get something going here. And uh, brought together seven artists, and we all went down and looked at the space. I said, here's the deal. I'm going to sign a six-month lease. Let's see if it works. And it has. And that's right <clears throat> on Elm Street. It was on Elm Street, yeah. Yeah, but you're still on Elm Street. No, we're on Main now. 
Are you right? Uh, okay, where are you? By the Pecan Lodge? Right yeah, now? about two doors down. I never even knew you moved. I thought you were still right by Club Dot. We've, we've been in the new space longer than we were the old one. Okay, so you like several years ago you've moved over on me. Yeah, 2013. But you're still right there in the core of the Deep Oh, Elm. absolutely, yeah. If it wasn't for being in the core of Deep Elm, we wouldn't have made it through the pandemic. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, thank God we've got enough tourists walking by and coming in and buying souvenirs or whatever, you know. Well, I'm on vacation. I'm going to get a memento of visiting Dallas, Texas. So, well, and that's very smart that you've you've changed your business model now that we're all grown up and we can say the word <laughs> business. That you've evolved your business to where it does, uh, your it's profitable. That the tourist stream is coming through, and you can make some money to pay the overhead, so you can show the real artists. Yeah, that I'm sure is your passion. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's and that's really smart because you know back in the '80s it was. It's a revolution, man. We don't care about money. It sure We're going to change like it, the world, it? you know, and it was a revolution, <laughs> right? But, hey, it didn't make mm-hmm. money. And like I say, now, you know, once you have kids, everything changes, mm-hmm. right? So do you, did, is, is, uh, is Frankie your only child? No, I have a daughter, Amber. Okay, I thought I knew that, but it was kind of mm-hmm. vague. So I just wanted to ask and make sure. So tell us about Frankie and, and Amber. Uh, Frankie was born in 86. Amber was born in 89. I actually stopped and got a real job during that time period. Like I waited tables and bartended at the premier club in over by SMU on uh, 75. And uh, a buddy of mine was the GM there and gave me a job almost immediately. And I did that for two and a half years. It's amazing what loving your kids will make you do. It? Well, I just had to get some kind of stability into my life, you know? <laughs> right. And uh, about two years into it, I started really cranking out the art again and doing murals solid. And um, my wife asked me, so when's the next time you're working? Tomorrow? I said, nope. Next day? Nope. Well, when are you, when are you going to go back to work? I'm on a permanent leave of absence. They offered me a job here at Signature Athletic Club, just a few blocks from here, um, to be the GM of the Sign- Signature Athletic Club restaurant and bar. And so it was a crossroads for me. It's like, okay, am I going to go into this corporate thing now or am I going to get back to the art? Well, I make more money doing the art anyway, so, okay. <laughs> I'm not going back to work, but I have a door open in case I ever want to come back. And Sometimes I still think about dropping by, just say, oh, hey, remember me? Tell me if I ever need a job again and come back. I'm ready. But now it's been, what, 10 years since you didn't need to do that? Yeah, this is in 1989. So oh, okay, so way more than 10 years. Like, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I had a time warp there. So, sorry. So you you had your kids going and your art's making the, the dough yeah. to keep rolling with the kids and everything. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Mostly doing nightclub interiors and murals and backdrops and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So. And then occasionally the paintings, and it, it always always fluctuate. I don't know. I've been very fortunate to, you know, a lot of people give me credit for her reviving live music in Deep Elm for having Studio D. A lot of people give me credit for creating street art in, in Dallas, you know, being the godfather of street art in the Deep Elm neighborhood and that kind of thing. And just, you know, been fortunate to be just one step ahead in many cases of what the current trend becomes. Now I'm, you know, 65 plus at this point, <laughs> kind of slowing down a little bit and not really interested in much more than just making sure that my wife and my daughter are in good shape. Right. But you just did a, a current project. that's really uh, noteworthy is you just did the blues mural on, in the, in uh, the alley. Uh, you know, there's crowd us. Is that Clover? Yeah, yeah. So right behind the old theater gallery. I actually painted the back of the old theater gallery. Yeah, so the old theater gallery is there on Commerce and then St. Pete's. And then it, it's between uh, the whatever they're calling Deep Ellum Live now, Liberty something hall. Anyway, yeah, so so you just did a huge long, like that's maybe am I, it's 70 feet or 100 feet long there? How no, long? I just did the back of the theater gallery. So it's like long. 50 feet, 60 yeah, feet. Then. About 20 by 50 or so. 20 yeah, that's, that's huge and all hand painted. What characters are on that one? I haven't been down to see it yet. I did uh, Johnny Winter and Sam Myers. Okay. Sam Myers used to play with Elmore James. And I mean, he's a pretty big name right there. Mm-hmm. Sam Myers won quite a few WC Handy Awards. And I used to know him from uh, hanging out at Schooners after I, you know, kind of settled down and bought my house. Right. Schooners on Lemon? 
Uh, no, Oaklawn. Skillman and Gaston. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the one that was over there on Oaklawn <clears> and Lemon. It was called something like Scooter. Strictly Taboo. No, no, no. That was at Lomo Alto. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so it doesn't matter. But Schooners, yeah, yeah. You're talking East Dallas. Blues Bar, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. But Sam used to hang out there all the time. And uh, my second wife worked there. And so I got to know Sam pretty well. Nice. Yeah, so let's see. Back to... Uh, so the kettle's doing really well now. I mean, I see you guys promotion all the time. You have great shows. Uh, you have, you know, cutting edge, new art shows all the time. Real, real artists, real artists, painting original artwork. That's, that's cool. Not really commercial. And yet you, you hang in there with, I guess you sell some commercial product line or whatever to the tourists or whatever. Cause it is a, a you know, deep Ellum's a touristy scene now. Well, and that's okay. I'd say the only really touristy or knickknacks, whatever mementos we would have would be like prints of paintings or prints of murals or, you know, maybe uh, the wine walk classes. My wife runs a wine walk, the Deep Elm Wine Walk, and we have a different artist design a glass every month. And uh, we sell those and, yeah, why not? <laughs> no, that's beautiful. I mean, prints, <clears throat> I think prints should never be, uh, get a negative uh, review because art that's original, beautiful art should be expensive because of what goes into it. You know, the artist's soul and the artist's time and the art, the, the gifting and the artistry to make that art is so valuable and everybody doesn't have the money to buy the original. Right. right. So to me, a print is like, you can have that in your home and you can still honor the original art. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, now when you talk about koozies I mean, with Van Gogh on them, then yeah, we might no, be, no. you know. It has crossed my mind to try and do an immersive type show, though. You know, What's that? Get a bunch of pro projectors and do like immersive kettle and have all of our artist artwork projected all over the room and walk through and like, ooh, ooh, ooh you know. Well, no, that's a smart idea. And also, everybody else is doing the immersive Van Gogh and the immersive Frida Kahlo. And totally. That'd be a great <clears> thing to do. And also, you can do like an online uh, gallery or exhibit. Yeah, we've got that going you know, on. People are doing those. You're already doing that, I'm sure. Yeah, that's very cool. So. But I mean, like old Gypsy Tea Room prints, you know, I, <clears throat> I probably painted close to a thousand prints on, or uh, paintings on the side of Gypsy Tea Room announcing upcoming shows. And uh, I probably got about 30, 40 different ones, just little postcard size. But, you know, if you like Lucinda Williams or you like Reverend Horton Heat or you like old 97s or you like... Willie Nelson or whatever it may be, you know, I painted it and uh, right. I remember a memento those, from the past. I remember those murals <clears throat> well on the side of the gypsy tea room. And then um, uh, that was a great time in there with a lot of shows. I want to touch on something you brought up a minute ago was that deep Ellum. It sort of died in 05 after that incident at the, at the tea room or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I will say the door the club we opened in 98 down by, on the other end. We were kept it going. But it's so funny. We were untouched <clears throat> by any of that. It was yeah. so beautiful because we had, you know, 1,500 kids in there for shows, and they didn't care about Deep Ellum. We were a destination, and you know this. A concert venue, sometimes you're a destination, so it doesn't matter what's going on in the neighborhood. In fact, it's better when the neighborhood's a ghost town because you have parking and you don't have any other people to conflict with. They come to your venue, see the show, and go home. Everybody's happy. You know? That's why we do most of our events on Thursday nights now. So yeah. we don't have to compete with the Friday, Saturday night crowds. That's smart. That's really yeah. smart. And your clientele that comes to the kettle now, I guess, uh, could you say a particular demographic, or is it real varied? It really varies. I mean, 20 to 70 then. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and from all over town. I like them right around 35, 40. You know, right. where they're settled down enough and they can actually afford to buy things. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. They're a lot of fun. Well, yeah, showing art, I mean, it's a, it's a very fulfilling and gratifying process to show art and to promote music and theater because it's something you can get behind and believe in. It enriches people's lives, you know, and it's it's really rare. In, this, in the world we live in, there's so much, uh, you know, one of my soapboxes of many, is the cloning in suburbia. You know, everybody wears the same clothes and they watch the same movies and they talk about Kardashian or whatever. And, and you and I have both, you know, lived in and created worlds outside of that. 
where it's kind of like real art expressed by a real human, uh, you know, writing or seeing or painting about something they feel and, and people connecting it, I think it to that, I think is a very important and sort of an endangered species. More and more so every day. Everybody's locked into their phone now looking at those pictures and getting the laughs and the jokes and the interaction, the human touch almost. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> From going. That's right, yeah. So, I mean. The, you, that pandemic, I mean, that was, whew, threw us for a loop, threw everybody for a loop. But, um, you know, we started really going out just a few weeks ago. We've been doing events at Kettle, but that's different because I'm standing behind the counter and I'm interacting from behind the counter and that type of thing. But. We actually went out for the first time about a month ago and just like, oh, I'm getting a little bit loopy here and I'm hanging out and here are these people and really nice people. I recognize that person. They come up and give me hugs and buy me a shot or whatever. And like, who are you? You know, if you don't, if you don't mind my asking, what was your name again? <laughs> well, yeah, it's it really a reacquaintance. It got very awkward. Yeah, yeah. It's like reacquainting to everybody, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, hopefully there won't be another you know, lockdown and all that. But I don't see it coming. Uh, it would be hard to say that it would never happen because it was, it was, anyway, it had a lot of, uh, it had a lot of uh, impact on whatever side you were on. You know what I mean? A lot of people benefited from that thing. Yeah, I want to figure out how to do that next time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it didn't benefit me. We closed... The profit bar and the door six months before the lockdown because yeah. uh, Westdale, they kicked everybody out of the whole block and they, uh, you know, to remodel the whole block. So a year later, we we're supposed to go reopen and uh, they're still remodeling. Oh, yeah. Two years but, later. Well, the, the, the virus postponed everything a year and a half. Then the city of Dallas held back permits for six months. So we're supposed to open in September and I'm prayerfully reconsidering but um you know it's it's like shops of legacy rates on leases now you know and uh, and it's a music the music industry is not what it was studio d was 450 a month 450 dollars a month for 4500 5000 square feet something like that you know people are like what yeah so tell let's talk about studio d <clears throat> you opened in 82 and it was on Main and... It's up towards the very end of Main, up by Ex- Exposition. I so mean, right I mean, right there not, by, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of them, right where it curves, where Main curves, before the Yeah, curve. yeah, like almost like a block over from Sons of Herman. And so you did all kinds of shows. You did Meat Puppets, all the bands you liked. Yeah, it's not like I really even liked them. I just wanted my friends to have a place to play. Right. And uh, the butthole surfers would show up every week pretty much. And Frank, who's playing tonight? Can we play too? And I said, yeah, sure, you know. So and then Gibby's like, you know, you need to be talking to Chuck Dukowski. Chuck will help you out. He's got a lot of those SST bands. So I talked to Chuck. And I remember the Meat Puppets played like a Wednesday night in New York City and got in their van and drove all the way down here for a Friday night in Dallas, Texas. And that's when we become close friends. And I don't know, but that That's just opened cool. up. That just opened things up, you know. The, the working with the the butthole surface, also the Dead Kennedys. You know, I'm not going to say I was a huge fan of them at the time. You know, at the time, actually, I liked Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers a lot more than I did the hardcore stuff. But uh, right, right. Well, if you have an eclectic musical taste, mm-hmm. then you like everything. Yeah. So you know, you're not going to love every band of any genre. It was pretty mind blowing to you know be standing in the place that you were living, halfway back in the room and hearing Holiday in Cambodia echoing throughout the room with that beautiful you know twangy guitar riff. I was right. going, man, wow, this is good. This is really <laughs> cool, you know. Right, right. I, I dig it, man. Yeah, I, I experienced the same thing with you know Smithereens, Chili Peppers, Jane's Addiction. We had everybody coming around, yeah. but we got our tours. I met Mark Lee, yeah. a four six two, when I was building the fast and cool for Shannon Wynn, and uh, John, and uh, the, uh, the the neon guy at Fast and Cool. Mm-hmm. Can't think of his last name right now. Did you ever know Dennis Brogiotti? He was the other guy. He was a blues guy. Played with Stevie Ray. And anyway, so Mark Lee started bringing all those tours. And I know what you're saying. When you're living, I was living at the theater gallery, and we had all the bands loading in and playing, and it was super cool. So. Studio D 
was in 82 and you until what how long did y'all stay open just a year they wouldn't really renew, renew the lease so they you couldn't was, re, they wouldn't renew no okay. i don't know why but i mean i remember we had the misfits in there the original misfits with glenn danzig and all that and he was being a real whiny bitch at the time just like you know what why are we playing dumps like this we should be playing stadiums i'm like because it's there's 250 people out there that want to see you, and you'd look really stupid playing in front of 250 people in a stadium. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> well, he was a dreamer. We'll give him that. Yeah, well, now he's playing stadiums. That's so. that's awesome. Okay, so you guys, so you were open until like, the, you were open in A2, mm -hmm. and uh, so you still wanted to do a venue, but you didn't they yeah, wouldn't renew it. Right, so I... Ended up going over to tracks for a little bit and doing shows at your place. And then Charlie opened up, or actually Charlie opened up his place pretty quick. It's funny. I remember meeting Charlie for one of the first times. He's leaning against the wall at Studio D, kicking, trying to kick a hole in the wall. And I grabbed him by the throat and clocked my fit, you know, got my fist wound up. What the hell are you doing, man? What are you doing? Oh, it's punk rock. No, it's not punk rock. And boy, did he learn his lesson on that one. Owning, you know, Twilight Room, Circle A Ranch, whatever. Just every week, somebody's plugging up the toilet and it's leaking downstairs and kicking holes in the wall. And What a classic story. You're sitting at your club, Studio D, and Charlie Gilder's kicking a hole in the wall before he opened Circle A Ranch. Mm -hmm. And so sir, he opened Circle A in 83, I presume. 83, 84. I don't know. When did you open? It must have been 83, because... I, the theater gallery started, we opened, I rolled in there in the summer of 84 okay. and we opened a gallery and then we had bands start playing in October. We had Zeitgeist from Austin mm -hmm. was the first gig. And the artists that I was showing in a gallery were friends with Zeitgeist and they brought them around. So we, then we had local bands like every week in 80 fall of 84. And it was, trust me, eclectic. We had everything from Robert Lee Cobb mm -hmm. and the local heroes with the end from Highland Park at New Year's Eve. And you you probably know Joe Popo Pie mm. from San Francisco, punk guy. We had him. So then, uh, so I went to the twi I went to the Circle A Ranch in '83 with the girl from Denton. Okay. So you had Studio D in '82. Then there was a gap in Deep Ellum for a year and a half. Yeah, I ended up doing shows like at Tracks, which so is you ridiculous. would promote shows other venues. Yeah, yeah. and uh, a little place called the East Side up on Upper Greenville Avenue, and just whatever venues would have me. Uh, poor David's pub, whatever, just, you know, I've got a show. Whoever wanted to risk their relationship with their neighbors with punk rock followings <laughs> coming around. It's funny, you remind me of a tension we I'll, had. I'll, you you keep the beer, I'll keep the door. Yeah. Done deal. Well, that's smart. We had, we had quite a tension in Deep Ellum when all the kids from all the suburbs started coming to Theater Gallery, and it wasn't mostly punk, but sometimes we'd have a punk show, and the, the kids with the – two foot blue mohawks on the skateboards and next door was the Texas butcher supply mm -hmm. and they would get graffiti written on their walls or every once in a while a window broken out. And it was a big deal. Those really nice guys that own that butcher shop, yeah. they'd come over on Monday and say, Hey man, we've been here 70 years and we don't like what's going on. And all I could say was, Hey, we don't, we're not into violence. We don't want anybody hurting anything, but we really dig bands and art and theater. And we're, we're going to do this, you know, so we've got to coexist here. And, uh, but it's tough. So every band, you know, every band, every musical, spiritual reality brings the crowd with them that has sort of their way of relating to the neighborhood. <laughs> and it got pretty rough sometimes in the eighties with all those bands. Cause it's somehow, I guess the twilight room being downtown on central and Maine, they, they didn't affect that area as much. But when, when those bands have come to deep Ellum, they, a lot of the crowds caused a little bit of trouble. Yeah. I don't know. I just remember I was surrounded by a lot of, uh, homeless and junkies and artists, musicians, you know, but the homeless and the junkies, the mentally ill people, that was uh, not old. Yeah. You know? The skinheads, they came in from California or wherever, and they would lived in the abandoned building next door. It used to be the Dallas Life Foundation, and they'd want to get into the shows and stuff and say, okay, you clean up. And you, you can come to the show, that type of thing. They stole a brand-new Cadillac out of Phoenix, 
brand new Cadillac, 1986 Cadillac, something like that, you know. And one by one, they started getting busted or going home. And finally, the last one's like, here, Frank, I'm the last man standing. Here's the keys to a brand new Cadillac. I'm like, I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want a stolen car. <laughs> but you can make money with it. I, was, I want nothing to do with this, okay? It's then, interesting. So you really, you liked all kinds of music, but you were promoting mostly edgy punk and hardcore. Mm-hmm. And you were bringing, it, it's almost, I have a tendency to sort of like shoot myself in the foot. You were almost doing that in a way because you you liked art and you had a, you know, you wanted to create a scene, but you were bringing the element that was kind of destroying your own thing at the same time. I fell into that trap hugely. Uh, we're not the only ones. I've known a lot of people. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mark and Danny, they kept the whole thing going at Hot Club throughout all of our endeavors at least until they got bigger and they started doing Bronco Bowl. Yeah, I think Hot Club stopped in like 82 or 3. Or 84, I don't know. But that was pretty amazing. Yeah, it was. It must, it must have been 83. How, when, did stop, how, when did Hot Club start? That's 79. So they had a four or five year run there. Yeah. And like you said, they went on to bigger venues and bigger shows. They were doing everything at the Bronco Bowl. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, Mark Lee did McCartney at um, – Texas Stadium. Texas Stadium. So they, they did. I think they did him in New Orleans and Houston, Dallas, Phoenix, like four or five shows with McCartney. Right. So yeah, they got quite large there for a while. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, so what are you passionate about now? What's the main thing you're, you're that keeps you ticking in the art world? I mean, I know family is important. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I got a lot of a lot of stuff. I need to. You know, I'm getting older. I'm wanting to knock out at least another series or two of paintings because I haven't done that in a little while. That's definitely in in the books. I'd like to maybe put together a book of some sort because I've got lots of memories and scraps and pieces of paper and it almost be like a giant scrapbook of, you know, stuff. A memoir. I mean, yeah, of some kind. I mean, you know, putting together the tunnel back in 93, 94, and then again in the early 2000s and actually being the man to negotiate start taking down the tunnel and replacing it with the traveling man. That was a pretty hairy thing for me to do. All the other property owners were there. I wasn't a property owner, but they were all there. And they're just like, oh, yeah, Dart Station, that sounds good. I'm like, what about the art? So you What about the, the gateway? So you're saying you assembled the artist for painting the tunnel. Yeah. And then when uh, it was determined that Dart was going to roll over the tunnel, mm-hmm. you were key in negotiating, all right, if it's going to happen, we get to have this art project yeah this the, what are you going to do for art oh we're going to put fifty thousand dollars in in each um station mm-hmm. i'm like you do that for every station i'm talking about removing the gateway to the neighborhood oh we'll get back with you on that and then the next meeting they came back and said we've got 1.5 million dollars to do a replacement gateway to the deep elm neighborhood so so the and you did the sculptures. What did you call the sculptures? I didn't do the sculptures. I'm sorry, but what are they called? The traveling man. Okay, it's, there's the guy standing all the way up, the chrome uh, sort of silver, and then he's sitting on a bench, and then he's coming out of the. Right. I forgot the group that did that. Um, that would be um, old Oldham Brad Old Oldham. Okay. It's pretty cool. I mean, I've 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 got some ideas to you know improve it a little bit. <laughs> Well, they weren't going to give me the contract, and I knew that because I just cost them one and a half million dollars. So, right, right. Well, that's cool that you had that voice, though. Somebody had to do it. Oh, yeah, that you could stand up for the art and, and everything. It's like how many times did you do train, you know, train lines? Yeah, that's real money. Yeah, I've got some footage of that tunnel. When I shot a movie down there about 18 years ago, I was, I was looking for things in it the other day, and we've got great footage of that tunnel and a car driving through it. That, um, but I'm I'm looking for more archival stuff on that. You probably have some. I got a bunch of you know stills. Yeah. Did you ever, did you ever do an expose of each piece in the tunnel separately? That'd be cool. I've got them somewhere, you know, mm-hmm. collected. But it's not like I shot them necessarily. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. I just make things happen. I don't necessarily document. I think that's for other people to do. Other people like doing documentation. You no. Know? <laughs> I understand it. Well, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Documenting. Uh, and, you know, everybody has different giftings and everybody has, you know, they're good at different things. And that's what's great about when a, when a scene happens. Uh, I mean, remember when uh, 
when the scene kicked off in 84 at the theater gallery, it's like, it just seemed like everybody converged on the neighborhood and you had people that were good at, at, uh, you know, the techie side, people that were good at managing and organizing and it takes everybody to be able to do something really well. Right. Yeah. And it's, it was, you know, it started off like our gang comedy, but it, uh, it became a little more sophisticated as the years went by. Um, so tell us, uh, if you want to, Tell us about Frankie, your son, who was a great artist and musician. Uh, my son was born in October of 1986. Um, fell in love with playing the guitar and that type of thing. When he turned 12, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you like $200 to do what you want or I'll buy you a guitar. It's up to you. And he's like, uh, a guitar. I said, okay, well, I never want to hear the words. I want to be a rock star when I grow up. Come out of my, your mouth and we'll go get you one right now. And we did, and he pretty much became a rock star anyway, at least on a local level, big time. But uh, well, he, he had such a personality. You know, he was just a kid that everybody liked. Yeah, I think uh, he was highly inspired by Reverend Horton. He, who you really helped bring into the scene way back in the day, and he really liked the the punk rock, rockabilly. You know, the, the Ramones meets Elvis Presley or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. Johnny Cash. And uh, played a really good music, but uh, played a little too hard, a little too often, dabbling with a little too many drugs, had his heart broken, played a gig, came home, found his girlfriend in bed with somebody else, stayed up all night, <clears throat> played a gig on New Year's Eve, and then committed suicide. Man, I know. I'm, I'm, and the, sor the story's tragic and beautiful all at the same time, you know? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, uh, I can't imagine losing a son, but it's like your son... It's, it's, he was such a perfect life, it, you know, that he lived in a short time in a way, right? Yeah, and burned too bright. Yeah, there you go. And so you have a foundation of, uh, for his uh, cause. Uh, upon his death, as opposed to a funeral in the box and all that stuff, I just said, burn him. They were going to do a memorial. He worked at Club Dada. Club Dada is almost ready to reopen. Guys, get your shit together. We're opening a day early. Going to do a memorial. I had like eight bands play, something like that, and <clears throat> ministers and, you know, family, that kind of stuff, speaking in between bands. And um, it was really beautiful. We charged 10 bucks ahead of the door, did about 1,000 people thereabouts. And cause it was time to, well, what do you do? What can you do? You can't bring them back. But maybe you can address the problem that he had. So how do you do that? You can't do anything without money, so let's charge money. Um, 77 days later, I think it was, his bass player did the same damn thing. His bass player that found him did the same stupid thing. Hmm. Raised some more money. Then we did a couple of 45 Fest and Art of the Guitars. You know, 45 Fest every year, bands would play and donate their services for raising more money until eventually we got enough money that uh, we were able to basically start the Foundation 45 and hire actual, real, licensed um, therapist hmm. give free consultation to artists and musicians originally just out of deep Elm, but now it's i think it's like five or six or seven of them and they're all over oak cliff and fort worth and i don't know that's beautiful so it's grown <laughs> yeah like the seed was planted and it's helped more and more people yeah i just helped out with the the fundraising part and you know pretty much okay this is what i'd like to see happen but it really it seemed like every time we do an event people would gravitate towards me and like, oh, thank you so much, Frank. I really appreciate you doing that. You know, I walked in the minute my dad pulled the trigger on his head and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, crap, I don't want to hear this. Oh, no, here's another one. Here's another one. You know, oh, I found so-and-so, my best friend, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, it drags me too far down. I can't handle this. So I understand. <clears throat> yeah, well, like I said a minute ago, everybody has different giftings. We're all good at different things. You're like an idea guy, you know, but not necessarily a counselor to, you know, listen to everybody. No. You know? <laughs> Everybody's good at different stuff. And you know what? I really respect those empathetic types that really know how to help somebody when they're struggling like that. It's, it's a huge gift. It's pretty amazing that uh, it's, it's happening and it's growing and it's, you know, I mean, they were on Texas today the other morning or something like that. I saw somebody posted it and watched and like, very good. It's good. awesome. Yes. 
Well, you know, nothing lasts forever, and this is kind of flying by. We're wrapping up close to the end of the show. And um, so here's the question. It's, it's interesting. We just kind of almost flowed right into it. The question I ask every guest is, what do you think about God? Mm, that's a good one. And there's no, you know. <clears throat> no right or wrong answer. It's that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am very spiritual. I believe that uh, whatever, whoever it is, will be revealed in due time. And I look forward to actually seeing what that's all about. Um, I believe in the afterlife. I believe that, I don't know, I've had a lot of mediums and that type of stuff. My great-great-grandfather was really good friends with Houdini and helped disprove seances with him in New York City and that type of stuff. And, you know, I've, my mother used to do a little bit of that type of stuff on the side and just for, you know, drunken party tricks. But when you see a table get upset and walk out of the room by itself, you realize, like, oh, there is something more, you know? So I know there's something else out there, but I'd really, I'm not going to profess to say that I know exactly what it is. I get what each religion says to a degree, and they all, for the most part, seem to align, at least to me accordingly. And uh, I do happen to have a couple of good friends that are ministers, and, uh, you know, even that, they say, you know, I honestly, I really can't swear, you know, but this is what I believe. You know, and I think that's important. Everybody, I think it's important. Everybody believes we need a people need more of a moral compass in this day and age, considering how um, lightly people respect life at this point. I'd really appreciate it if they bring back civics civics classes in school for people to understand and learn to respect each other and elders and that type of stuff, and show some responsibility to themselves, their family, the planet, and to mankind in general. You know. Right. That's um, huge. Yeah. Just honoring everything. Like you just said, elders, parents, neighbors, just the, the fact that something is sacred is, is, is a very, is a it's different. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's different. So might want to just check it out and see, Hey, that's pretty cool. I never thought of that, you know? So that's, that's how I feel about it. You know, I look forward to the day when I, when I can see what's going on, but I'm not in any hurry to get there yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, we're made to live as long as we can and live long and prosper. And, and I know and hope you will. And, uh, well, that's a very honest, uh, stance. You know, it really is. I mean, I will say that I, I remember you just brought back a memory to me where this guy came walking down. I was standing in front of the profit bar one night in 87. And this guy walks down the street with a 12 foot cross. I remember that guy. Remember Brian Cheppy. I don't remember his he name. He walked just, all around the hood, right? And he, we, we would know he had a really good gig going if he showed up. <laughs> <laughs> He'd carry that cross. And I remember he came up one day, and I was like, I had long hair, and I'm the skinny know-it-all guy leading the, the deep LM scene. And he's like, walks up, and he's like, you know, hey, man. I was like, hey, I like you being here. You know, you're theater for the neighborhood. And he goes, <laughs> well, I just want to tell you, man, Jesus is the only way. And I was like, well, all religions kind of agree they all say, love your neighbor and, you know, do right and all this kind of stuff. He goes, yeah, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no way to the Father but him. And I was like, well, you know, that's whatever. That's cool. But, you know, you want a, you want a beer? You know, <laughs> I probably made some wisecrack. And he left. And a month later, it's funny because a month later, my black janitor invited me to his church, you know, and mm -hmm. my Italian girlfriend was out of town, and I went. And I, 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 I know that when I surrendered my life at my janitor's place, I actually I met God in spirit, you know, the resurrected Christ. I've, I've met him and he's real. And all I can do is tell people like you that I like that it's real, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I respect your stance. And you said a lot of wisdom, you know, in what you said is that to honor life and to just accept each other is love. Ultimately, you're talking about just loving everybody That's now. God's supposed to be is love. Yeah, God is love. And, and so, you know, so I believe he came in a body and he 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 manifest in a body and hugged the lepers and forgave the prostitutes and called the religious leaders snakes, you know, and 
died and resurrected. But if you don't know that yet or you don't believe it yet, I just look at it like the only reason I know is because he, he, he slapped me in the head and I just, man, he made me know. You know what I mean? And it's like religion is, it's, it's so funny because you're kind of a, in a way, you're, a, you're an edgy artist, punk rock guy. And it's like, if you notice, all the, poker, all the rock scene is against religion. Mm-hmm. And it's for good cause. In a way, because religion is really what keeps everybody away. It's like religious fight, religions fighting against each other mm-hmm. and religious demands. Like you got to go to this building, you got to do this and that. You know what I mean? And it's like if you just go solid love and solid truth and respect and love each other, I think the whole human race would advance just right there. I agree. You know what? Well, it's almost time we got to wrap this thing. I'll give you one more comment. I'm going to remind everybody, buy my book. It's on Amazon. Oh, yeah. It's the only way we can have this show is buy the Russell Hobbs book. And it's, it's, it's really about why we're here, why life is such a struggle. I feel like there's a lot of answers in this book because I've been a seeker my whole life. You know, like there's got to be something more than the mall. There's got to be something more than, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I feel like I found a lot of nuggets and I put them in this book for everybody to read. <laughs> All right. So Frank's our guest. One more comment, my brother. You got anything? Any closing comment or exit words? No, Russell, thank you for having me. It's been a blast knowing you all these years. Um, it's been very entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Seeing all the things we've seen and done. And yes. uh, let's just hope that uh, humanity keeps moving forward. Yes. Well, good. Thank you for coming, man. Solve the differences and let's have some fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming. And and you're you're a ground, you're a salt to the earth guy, man. And uh, the city of Dallas is is very fortunate to have you around. So go to Kettle and buy some art. Talk to Frank, and uh, we'll see you next time on the Russell Hobbs Show.